either uh, maybe the pastor slipping me something to keep me from talking so much, or you know, he just doesn't like it too much. I have a tendency to believe that uh, that most likely is the case. We're going to be uh, going to John uh, chapter uh, chapter 19, verses 12 through 18. Consider his suffering. And uh, something that I've spent a lot of time researching and looking into, uh, even at agnostics, have proved. Uh, I watched a movie not, uh, not too long ago. It was called uh, uh, The Case for, case for, case for uh, Jesus, where this guy was an agnostic. His wife got saved, and he went through talking to people, talking to, uh, referring to a lot of uh, uh, Bible scriptures and things like that to try to prove that Jesus Christ didn't die for us, that Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead three days later. And uh, he basically did everything he could to prove it. But the good news is, through all this, he found God. Uh, through his research, he realized that this all happened. There was over 500 eyewitnesses of the account of Jesus' crucifixion. And this guy, to see his eyes open up and things like that, it's a very uh, compelling story. So, we're going to read uh, together. Let me just go ahead and rise, please. We're going to read John 19, 12 through 18. We'll just read it together. If you're there, say amen. Amen. Okay. Okay, and again. And from the state for the Bible, the Son to release him. But if you are straight out of saying, If thou let this man go, thou art the Jesus of Christ. Who is going to make it to the king speaking to his disciples? When Pilate the Lord heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in the place that the Lord had made in him. And in the heavenly room of the Bacha, and it was the preparation of the Passover, and about the sixth hour, and he said unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. And then he said unto them, Shall I crucify your king? And the Jews answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then they were the king, therefore, of them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and they led him away. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of his son, which is called the heavenly room of Golgotha. And where they crucified him, and two others with him, on the other side one, and Jesus in the midst. It's quiet. Let's pray. Jesus, uh, Lord, we come before you, Lord. Acknowledge him today that what price you paid for us, that we might have to turn a life, Lord, and we're humbled and uh, grateful for your sacrifice, Lord. But we also realize that we're unworthy of what you have done for us. Lord, let your words be guide, be the guide to me. That I would be only the mouthpiece, that I would Speak the words that you would have me say today. And Lord, that you would open the hearts and minds of each and every one of us to what you have for us today. Amen. Please be seated. I got it. I was funny, somebody must have knew I was talking because it's not very many people here yet this morning. But this, this lesson probably is one of the, not necessarily the hardest things to do, because again, uh, God has always put on my heart, every time I'm going through a rough struggle, He reminds me of the sacrifice that His Son did for me. And as I've looked at things we're going through right now, we're going through so much, the blessings have literally poured out upon us in such a way that There's just no time to get everything done. There's no time because uh, as of yesterday morning, we found out that we've been 
that's had to be done before uh, Saturday. Of course, we know on, on Fridays, nothing happens here. Can't get anything. So, we had to get everything done yesterday. So we're still going through this morning. The movers are coming. And I said, well, God, I just don't have time to do this lesson. And again, he pressed upon my heart the sacrifice that he made in the end of, of what he's been through. So the other day, I was sitting there reading my Bible, and the word time came up into my mind. And we come up with excuses. We don't have time to do things. We don't have, you know, I don't have time to play with my kids. I don't have time to read the Bible. I don't have time to pray. All these things. And I realized that time is an acronym for till I make excuses. And uh, so there's always time. God has pointed that out over and over again. But today we're talking about what is coming for us. As a powerful God of the world, Jesus proved that he loved the world through suffering he endured. On the cross, he willingly took punishment for sin and shed his precious blood so that we could be saved. Sometimes I feel I get goosebumps thinking about what he went through. Because again, I did a lot of research to it because I, I needed to understand why, before I came into the church, why, why would he do all this for me? Because of the things that he endured. Uh, the night before, when he was in the garden, how he anguished over what was coming. Even him knowing. He said, if this cup can be passed from me, let it be so. Not that he wasn't willing to do that. He just knew what he was going to have to endure. So, through this, we're going to kind of discover a little bit of what he went through. We're going to talk about the burdens of the cross. Verse 17 says, And he bearing the cross went forth into the place called the place of the skull, which is called in the Hebrew, Golgotha. And even that, just that, carrying the cross, to me would be sacrificing that, but it had that be beyond that. The punishment that he endured, the things that he went through, endured, to be spit on, to be despised, to be laughed at, be ridiculed for all these things that Jesus did. You know, I have to start looking at my life and ask myself, am I worthy of that sacrifice? Am I doing what he wants me to do to ensure that his sacrifice is not in vain? Or am I spending in Jesus' face? I have to ask myself that daily. It's an affirmation that I have to do to ensure that his sacrifice is never in vain. John 15, 13 specifically states, and we've used this a lot, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lead down his life for his friends. Nobody remembers the verse, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Read it. But we're going to talk more about that. So we're going to talk about the burdens of the cross. Okay? We're going to talk about the physical burden. We uh, reach back into Isaiah 53, verses 4, 4 and 5. We're going to talk about what he physically endured. Isaiah 53, 4 and 5 says, Surely he hath Born our griefs and carry our sorrows. Yet we did did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. 
that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Amen. I love that verse. Amen. I love it. Because it really specifically states kind of what it went through. He was beaten with reeds, he had a crown of thorns, smashed down on his head, and they had changed out his clothes for a purple robe. They said, all hail the king of Jews. They spit on him. But before that, they whipped him. They beat him. You know, three days later, they didn't recognize him. And I kind of wonder, when the disciples saw Jesus, the last thing they saw of him was battered, bruised, literally unrecognizable. His face was where they beat him with their fist. His body, where they took, took the whip, literally just tore pieces of flesh out of his body. The things that he went through would have made him almost unrecognizable. And I wonder at times if his disciples, when they saw him, they just didn't recognize him because of what they saw after he was taken down off the cross. He would have been literally unrecognizable. But the thing about it is he was whipped literally shreds of flesh was torn from him where they put bones of uh, uh, animals in, inside their things or rocks or whatever they had glass. And literally as it hit him
that it changed his life forever. <coughs> Even him as an actor, just pretending to be crucified, separated his shoulders several times during the film. And he explained to him, and he realized at that point how much Jesus had done for him.
He's burdened and he must have carried in that car. It must have been great. Knowing, uh, knowing what's going to happen. You know? Uh, and he did it alone. While the disciples were sleeping. He was praying to God. Proverbs 14 9 says, Fools make a mock of sin, but among the righteous, there is favor. If you ever had doubts about God loving you, just take a look at the cross and what it means to us.
we have direct access to God the Father because Jesus Christ shed his blood. I don't know if you guys can hear me. I mean, yeah, I'm not going that analogy a lot of time. But I think about, you know, because of his sacrifice and what he did. Um, in the States, they have all these amusement parks and things like that. And uh, amusement parks, if you buy a special ticket, like pay extra. You get head on line privileges. You don't have to wait in those long lines and long queues to get on the rides. You get what they call it a fast pass. You just walk right up to the front. Jesus is sacrificing the same thing for us. We have priority with God because of his, his blood. Again, something we should never forget. There's also the blessings of the cross. It's hard to imagine something good coming out of something so horrific. Although we know it is. The beauty of what he did, the sacrifice that he did. For us, it means everything. You should weigh that in your life, just like I have, just like I am, each and every day. The blessings of the cross. John 19.30 says, When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up his ghost. In other words, he died. But through this, obviously there's uh, four things that came out of this one act. One of his redemption. Hebrews 9.22 tells us that almost all things are by the law purged with blood. Without shedding of the blood, there's no remission. He made this, made that available to us. By, by, by the law, without the shedding of the blood, there cannot be
clean of the things that we've been carrying around. There's only one way for man to be reconciled with God, and that is through the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay, fourth thing is salvation. Because of his, the blood that Jesus Christ shed for us, he paid the penalties for our sins. We do not have to spend our lives hoping to earn enough merit to gain salvation. Matter of fact, you can't gain your salvation by you. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes up, cometh unto the Father yet by, yet but by me. You only one way, God. So if you're trying to do it, to come to church, or by maybe Instead of tearing each other down, 
know, the devil gets a lot of joy, excuse me, the enemy. I don't give him a name anymore because he's not worthy. But the enemy is loving the separation that we have in the church. Because as long as we're separated, we can't get the work done that we need to do. What is our primary goal? Somebody, what is our primary goal? To carry the gospel to people that haven't heard it, right? Not to tell somebody you're doing it wrong. We should guide them. Not admonish them, not talk down to them, not talk behind their back. None of this stuff. Because I'm telling you, Jesus Christ paid, it, paid an awesome price. And I think sometimes that he would be ashamed of some of the things that we're doing to each other. Instead of preaching the gospel, we're tearing people down. And that's not what I'm here for, guys. I'm here to show love because that's what I was shown by God. Just, just give that some thought. Some serious thought before you start tearing people down. In conclusion, we've looked at the burdens that Jesus Christ carried. The blood that he shed, the blessings that he gives us for us to have redemption, justification, reconciliation, and salvation. Jesus Christ had to suffer. Although it was painful, he loved us so much that he was willing to go to the greatest extent conceivable to bring us forgiveness. As Christians at times we suffer, but nothing can compared with the suffering that Jesus Christ bore for us. <coughs> Sometimes we become weary and exhausted and may be tempted to throw in that towel. But it's at these times that we should look to the cross and be reminded of the price that was paid for us. I left, uh, I don't know if it's there, but the homework, uh, I always like homework now, of what we heard. For even here unto 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 21 we have the mystery, okay? For even here unto what he called it's talking about us Christians because Christ also suffered for us do you see the next four words? Leaving us on what? Look 
our disciplines, leaving us an example that we should follow in his, in his, are you with me? That we should follow in his steps. He just mentioned about the Lord Jesus Christ suffering and now he said that we should follow in his, in his steps. He gave us that example and he wants us to follow that example. Look at verse 22. Who did no sin? Neither was God found in his mouth. Did the Lord Jesus Christ do anything wrong? Meron sa bang, meron ba sa kinawang mali? Wala. Did he ever lie? No. Nothing. Look at 23. We are going to the application here. Look very carefully. Who, when he was, what? Come on, help me. Who, when he was? Reviled. When he was reviled, when he was ridiculed, when he was mocked, what do you do if you are ridiculed, if you are mocked, or if you are, you know, if you are reviled? The Bible says, what did the Lord do? What did he do? How did he act? Not react, but act. Oftentimes we react. Okay. React, reacting is different from acting. When you react, you are doing something in response to what others are doing. But when you act, you are doing what is right. The Bible says, who, who when he was reviled, what? Reviled not again. When he suffered, he what? Threatened not. But what did he do? Committed himself to him that judged righteously. Look, look very carefully now. Don't miss this point now. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. That we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were a sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishops of your souls. Now, don't get, don't, don't get lost now. Okay, follow me. We come to chapter 3. This is a continuation. Do you get this? What is the first word in verse number 1? Come on, you help me. Read the word. What is the first word in verse number 1? What is the first word in verse number 7? Likewise. Okay, let's go back to verse number 1. Likewise ye wives. When you say likewise, what do you mean? He is comparing us to the previous example given. The Lord Jesus Christ did all these things. He was revived, he revived not again. He suffered, he threatened not, and all those things. He had no sin, and yet he took the sin that belongs to us. And now he is saying, likewise ye wives. What? Be in subjection in your own husbands. That if any obey not the word, they may also without the word be won by the conversation, by the manner of life of the wives. While they behold your chase, conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be the outward adorning or the plate of hair. Hindi ito yung pinaka-purpose ng mga babae yung magandang maganda ka. Magandang meron kang mga jewelries or na dyan. But that is not the purpose. No? That is not your main objective, whose adorning let it not be the outward adorning of plating of hair or the wearing of gold or the putting on of apparel. It's not how beautiful your dress is. But let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meat and what? Look at the, the behavior of wives here, according to verse number 4. How should wives be? Uh, behaving. Even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being subjection to their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed uh, Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughter ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. So what are we saying? The Bible is telling us, He gave us the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then He said, likewise ye wives. 
The Lord wants the wives, the women, to emulate the example that was given by the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, you have to read beginning with verse number 21. Okay. When the husband is treating me like this, and so we fight. Okay. Well, what about the Lord Jesus Christ? Again, you have to read what the Lord Jesus Christ went through. Now we go to verse number 7. After saying, likewise, ye wives, he is saying, wives, be like the Lord Jesus Christ. Follow his example. Now he directs the, the message to husbands. He said, likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them, with our wives, according to knowledge. Study them. Okay. You study them. You do a thesis, you do a research, okay? After 30 years, you still don't understand. But at least you, okay. But the Bible says, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife, as unto the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. So we see the practicality of this lesson here. After telling us about what the Lord Jesus Christ suffered, going back again to verse 21, he said, I want you to, he lived, he gave us this example that we should follow in his steps. He did no sin, no God was in his mouth. When he was revived, he revived again. He suffered, he threatened not. But what did he do? But committed himself unto him that judged righteousness. So you know this is good. When there are differences, and it seems like the other party is, you know, very hard for them to understand your side. Just the Bible says here, uh, do what the Lord Jesus Christ did. Committed himself to him that judged righteously. And uh, I hope that we will learn something from this lesson today. Amen? The sufferings of Christ. Please meditate on what the Lord Jesus Christ went through. You know, and uh, especially the first part of the lesson, so emotional, and uh, and uh, uh, this should be our example that we will go through sufferings in life. Sometimes we will be treated, you know, uh, uh, people will not treat us uh, the way we want to be treated, but you know, the Lord Jesus Christ went through all those things. And uh, he lived a life that demonstrated love. We promote that in church. We love people. We do not condemn people here. Amen? Amen. Now we go to the accommodations and you know we meet people, they use uh, other versions with them. We, you know, we lovingly just show them the word of God. That's what you have available, you're using it. You do not, most often when we show them what is missing in the books that they are using, they are often shocked. And now we, we, we show them. We, who can blame them? They have no means of getting uh, King James Bible, so it's our responsibility to show them what is uh, what the difference is and lovingly give them a, a copy of, of the Word of God. But, uh, uh, okay, the Lord Jesus Christ was very firm. That's why the Lord Jesus, if you if you have to learn something about the Lord Jesus Christ, he was full of what grace and truth. He was so gracious and yet he would not compromise. Okay? We love people but not to the extent that we compromise. Okay? We stand for the truth but at the same time we do not assassinate people. Okay? You stand for the truth but in the process of doing it, be gracious. You know, you will hear some preacher, they will lambast you in the pulpit. What they are saying is true but the problem is there is no grace. But if we are going to be Christ-like, we have to be full of grace and truth like our Savior. He was truth, he was filled with truth, but he would never compromise. Okay? There is grace in his life, and those are the two things that will summarize our Christian life. Grace and truth, and of course, the love of Christ in our life. Thank you so much for that wonderful lesson. I hope that you will take this material and go through it. And we appreciate Brother Clay in spite of his voice. He did his best to teach us the lesson. And I hope that you will do your part. Okay? Uh, feed yourself, uh, feed your soul by going through this lesson. You have the verses and studying 
bits and pieces again. Let's pray, and uh, immediately after this, we will start.